comfortable and join with us uh, in the hidden meanings and the teachings of Jesus Christ. Those of you who have those little Bibles, um, I think we're on page 23. Uh, it's in chapter 22 of Matthew. And we've been covering for the last several weeks because it's uh, quite an exciting event, quite an important thing. And that is the question of uh, Matthew 22. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidding, bidden to the wedding. And they wouldn't come. And he sent others saying, hey, tell them that, you know, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and come on to the marriage. And verse 5, but they made light of it. And they went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and treated them spitefully and slew them. When the king heard, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers. And then he said to his servants, look, the wedding's ready, but they which were called aren't coming, so aren't worthy. Go into the highways, and as many as you find, bring them to the marriage. That's verse 9. So the servants went out and gathered as many as they could, bad and good, and brought them to the wedding. <clears throat> you know, I, I've been teaching this the last several weeks. And last night, in the midst of all the garlic bread and chocolate brownies and all of this stuff, I was visited by the Spirit that spoke to me about today. And he said to me, do you have your head on straight as to what this is about? And I converse, and I converse with that in my head when it speaks to me like that. I, I, I said, I think so. I mean, I'm doing pretty good. You know, I got all the scriptures and I'm teaching. This. But he said, I don't really think that you're aware of the wedding. You're on to it. I've told you about the wedding. But you're reading here in the book and the wedding is being prepared. And I want to make sure that these people that you're speaking to are aware that they're invited to the wedding and that they should come. Now, <clears throat> as we're sitting here, God's creation, the universe, is at work. A tremendous thing is occurring. You see, in mysticism, which is the mythology of the zodiac, this great planet Uranus is called the Son of Heaven. It is God. It is heaven. It's the planet Uranus. This is the mythology of the zodiac. Down here is what's called Gaia. You can spell it different ways. But it's the earth. It's you and me. Okay? Now, in the earliest time, Uranus and Gaia were married. They're married. Bridegroom and bride. Uranus, the bridegroom. Gaia, the earth, the bride. Well, they had some children. And one of the children was Saturn, also known as Kronos. And he came against the marriage of Uranus and Gaia. He came against the marriage of the bridegroom and the bride. He came against the marriage of spirit and mind. He came against the marriage of that which is the higher realm and the lower. And what he did, he took his sickle which is very important because that signifies time. And his, his name, Kronos, means time. And he took his sickle, which was time, and he castrated God. He castrated Uranus. And what that means was no longer then, since Uranus had been castrated, no longer then could the seed come from heaven to bring forth new life. And what happens here is this was done by the sickle, which means it's done by time. It's your mind which is not capable, my mind which is not capable of concentrating and enjoying the present. We're always looking at the future or we're always looking at the past. Let's just go with it a little longer. We might have to pause if, if that becomes necessary for the mic. When you are focusing constantly on the future, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen next week? Come on, that's fine. Just walk right in front of us and don't worry about it at all. That's fine. When we concentrate on those things as to what's going to happen in the future or what's going to happen in the past, what happens is then we lose track of what's happening now. You're losing that which is the beauty of this moment. Many of you are preparing now for like today or tomorrow, New Year's Eve. 
but yet still your minds will be filled with things which will concern you about what's going to happen next week when you go back to work, or what's going to happen when so-and-so meets with you, or you meet with so-and-so, or what happened before. All of these things go on, and they take away, they rob us of the moment. They rob us of the beauty of this moment right here. Because there are many of us sitting right in this room today, right now, who are concerning themselves and thinking about what's going to happen next week, what's going to happen, or what did happen last week. It never ends. And we don't understand, we're never able to bring ourselves to grips with the moment, the precious, beautiful moment right now. When Kronos castrates Uranus, he does it with the sickle. In other words, it is time and the fear of time and the concern with time that robs you of that which is the God spirit. Well, so here then, the wedding between Uranus and I tell you what, uh, while you're looking, would you go in my briefcase and pull out another battery? The wedding between Uranus and Gaia is broken up by that which is Saturn. And just watch, just give me one second. Let's hope for the best. All right, look how fast I did that. <laughs> Are you with me? We have that which is Saturn, which has separated the bridegroom from the bride. And Saturn then overtook Uranus and established himself in the higher realms. That which is Satan. It's the same story as Satan which you see in the Bible. Okay? Well, then suddenly there comes out from the depths of the ocean which is God's deepest truth, Venus, which is love. And Venus, which is love, with the aid of the Cyclops, which is the single eye, overthrows Satan, overthrows Saturn, and restores Uranus to the position in the heavens. So now we have a situation where Uranus, the bridegroom, is coming back to claim his bride. It's happening right this minute. The great planet Uranus, which is called the Son of Heaven, the bridegroom, is on his way right now as we sit here to claim his bride. The bridegroom is coming back for the bride. And guess where the wedding is going to take place? In the sign of Aquarius. The man with the pitcher of water. Jesus Christ at the wedding with the pitcher of water. Changing the water to wine. It will happen. And the beautiful thing is, on the zodiacal clock, we have gone through six ages. We are coming to the seventh, which is the new of Aquarius. Jesus took six pots which were empty. There was nothing left in them. They were empty, void, representing the six ages which has gone. He <laughs> filled up the seventh. He filled it up new with wine. This is the wedding that we're talking about. And Jesus said, when you see the man with the pitcher of water enter into the house, this is the time. So here is Uranus coming back for his bride, Gaia. And what God is saying I have prepared a wedding for my son, the son of heaven, Uranus, and you're invited to be a part of it. Now you have to make a decision. What will your answer be? Here's your invitation, Andy, to be a part of this wedding. Each one of you here will live to see this occur. 
Each one of you here will be here, and you'll be a part of this wedding. But are you going to come? And you can, yes, you can say, oh, yes, I want to go. I want to be to the wedding. But you can be so busy. You can be so busy that there's not time, really. And, and right now is the time when you should be preparing for the wedding. Because the bridegroom cometh, as it says in the Bible. He is on his way. And you all have an invitation. Linda has an invitation. Joe has an Donna has an invitation. Mike, everybody in this room, you're invited to attend this wedding. And you have to ask yourself, will I go or not? And the only way that you can attend this wedding, as we'll read in this scripture, is if you have a wedding garment on. You're not allowed in the wedding hall unless you have the garment on, and that garment is meditation. Now, will you go? Will you go? And, and see, there's not a way that you can say, yeah, this isn't any religious gobbledygook I'm, I'm throwing at you. This is an astronomical fact. This wedding is going to take place. Most astronomers and astronomical scientists say that it's going to be in the year 2010. But an amazing thing, some of the, the best man is going to show up um, in 1993. In 1993, there will be a conjunction of Uranus with Neptune. And the ancients said, when that happens, invariably, it reveals to individuals the power of their subconscious. Great, great wells spring up of divine instinct, divine understanding, divine realization when this happens. Are you ready? Say. Many, many, the, many, the reason you're sitting here is so that you can be a part of of this wedding and to respond to this invitation because as you sit here every day a little closer and a little closer comes Uranus to embrace Gaia. The bridegroom is coming to reclaim the bride. The wedding feast is going to be at the same place it was in Cana when Christ the water man is there to take the six empty pots of the six ages which have gone and take it and turn it into wine so that the water man will pour forth covering the earth with the wine which is the spirit. Year 2010. But all of these great things will start happening as they prepare for the wedding. And it's what's, what's, so, what's so important about this, what's so important about this, is that you and I and everyone sitting next to you and everyone in this room and everybody in, in the world has an opportunity to say whether you're going to go to the wedding or not. And you know what unfortunately is going to happen? The overwhelming majority of the people will not show up. As it says, and look what it says in Matthew 22. Three, he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidding to the wedding, but they wouldn't come. They wouldn't come. I'm too busy. I have too much to do. I can't be bothered with this. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't want to go to the wedding. Dave said he, he was sorry that he missed the party. Okay. You can get away with missing our party, but don't miss this one. Don't miss this one. Bring yourself to a point where you say, I am going to that wedding and nothing, nothing, nothing in the world is going to prevent me from getting there. And the way that you go to that wedding is start to prepare yourself by lining up in your meditation experience, starting to plug into the directions that come the directions to the wedding hall, the directions to the wedding that come from the higher consciousness. Put it in the proper perspective. This is the lower self. This is the sun. You know, this is the sun intercoursing with the lamb. I used to think, you know, when I, you know, this, would you want to go to this wedding? Well, look, you're invited to a wedding. The king's having a wedding. Oh, well, that's great. Who's it for? His son. Who's his, maybe this is it. Who's his son marrying? The lamb. Son's getting married to a lamb. I say what Bill says, who's the you know, maid of honor, Mickey Mouse or Minnie Mouse? Or, you know, what kind of a wedding is this? But when the son marries the lamb, it means that that which is within you intercourses with the pineal or the pineal gland of the brain. You, when your energies raise up, you consummate this great wedding. So, 
See, see this, is one, this is one church where you can go out and confirm what I say, not in a book or not. You can, con you can go to a planetarium and confirm it. You can go to an astronomical book and confirm it. You can go to scientific knowledge and confirm it. Uranus is on his way back, and he is plowing across the heavens in a mighty way, and nothing, absolutely nothing, will stop him from this marriage, this rendezvous, this wedding he has with Gaia, with you, with the earth. And so now... The decision is here. Do we go? And it says, look what it says in Matthew 4, uh, 22, 4. He said, now they say, look, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed. We studied the oxen the other night. It's Taurus, it's the bull. It's your ego. Macho. See, I'm going to do things my way, you know. But you're never going to go to that wedding unless that's killed. Because there's going to be everything in the world to distract you. Everything in the world. We've had people say, oh, you know, I finally realized what the trouble is in my life. I'm not meditating. I'm not coming to church like I should. And I'm going to go there. And I'm going to be at church all the time. And I'm going to learn all of these things. And I'm going to do all of these things. And that's great. The intentions are tremendous. But when the doors are open, something came up. Something important came up. What could be more important than being a part of that? What could possibly be as important as being a part of that? And so the oxen is killed, which means that which is the self. Wow. The self is killed. That means that no longer then, through meditation, no longer is the self, no longer is the ego there to prevent you from coming to this wedding. And it says my fatlings are killed. Fatlings means desires. When that which is the self, that which is the desires are killed out by that which is the Holy Spirit, that which is the higher realm of consciousness, then you're free to rise up into this wedding. When you no longer have your relationships with these lower aspects of consciousness, then you can come to the wedding. You can come to the wedding. So how did Jesus tell you? You want to get prepared for the wedding? How would you like to get prepared for the wedding? You want to know what to wear? You want to know, you know, you always get prepared for the wedding. You should have seen yesterday at our house, getting prepared for the party, all kinds of stuff. I was running around, picking up this, picking up that, picking up the other thing, doing all these wonderful things, preparing for the party. Wasn't I? <laughs> what, do, what do you do when you go to a wedding? You buy, when you go to the wedding, you buy, the, the, you know what ladies do? They buy themselves silver shoes. Silver shoes. Where would you ever wear silver shoes? Yet you'll go to a wedding with silver shoes and a silver pocketbook, or golden shoes and a golden pocketbook. And there you are, very conservative people, and you allow some character and a, and, a, and a band to bring you up. And then you go up there and you say, do the huckabuck, do the huckabuck. And they do it at every wedding. They do it at every wedding. All of these things that they do. And then they'll bring Cousin Jerome out of the audience and he'll sing. Cousin Jerome sings. He's got a great voice. And invariably he'll sing, More than the greatest thing I give to you. And Cousin Jerome sings, and oh, it's a wonderful time. The cake is always the most miserable tasting stuff ever been made. <laughs> Never have they made cakes that taste as bad as when they give them in weddings and they cost thousands of dollars. <laughs> and they all prepare for days and weeks. We prepared. Joan had this gown. It was so, oh, what a gown. You shouldn't see such a gown like this. To marry me. I was so cute when I was there. Really, I was cute. You don't know how cute I was. She said, that's the guy for me. <laughs> and so we went and we had this thing. And she got, she got such a wedding. She got such a gown. It was my wedding. She had such a... She had such a beautiful gown. And we had we not even had a gown. She had a gown box. A beautiful gown box. To put the wedding gown to rest in the gown box. You know what we did with the gown box? We buried a dog in the gown box. I'm telling you. It was a big dog. We don't have a box. And we love the dog. What would be a fitting thing to bury this poor dog? A gown box. So we got a gown box. Where's the gown? I wouldn't go up there. It's probably walking around, I think. <laughs> but these are the preparations that we make. See? These are the preparations that we make for the wedding. But Jesus Christ said he wanted you to prepare for this wedding. 
See? His wedding. The Son of Heaven coming back to claim Gaia, the earth, in the year 2010. How would you prepare? Jesus told you, Matthew 6, 6, pray. When you enter the closet, close the door. That's an Eastern expression, meaning enter within yourself and close off the thoughts of your mind. Now, that's an instruction from Jesus Christ as to how you should prepare. I'm not instructing you via some, uh, some religious guy that wrote a book 100 years ago or 30 years ago. I'm telling you what Jesus Christ said. He used an Eastern expression for meditation. He said, when you pray, enter the closet and close the door. That means enter within yourself and close off the thoughts of the mind. That's in Matthew 6.6. 6. And what else do you need for the wedding? Jesus Christ in Matthew 6.22 if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. What does that mean? If your eye be single, your body will fill with light means if you meditate above the thoughts of the mind, you will fill with wisdom and understanding. Now, Jesus Christ said it. He's instructing you what you need to do in order to be ready for the wedding. See? I, what I'm, all I've asked, and sometimes, and I'm trying to be... You know, hold myself down and sit here and don't yell and don't scream. But all I'm trying to say to people is, for God's sakes, I'm not saying this. Rabbi Klink isn't saying this. Bishop Joe isn't saying this. Pastor Harvey isn't saying this. Jesus Christ is saying it. If your eye be single, if you practice the single eye, you'll fill with wisdom and understanding. It's in the book, Matthew 6, 22. And see, this is why people won't come, because it's a strange thing but these wedding instructions that are given by Jesus Christ, what happens? Those who were bidden, those who are the religious people, as right as the Bible says, make light of it. They don't want any part of it. They make fun of it. See? And then Jesus Christ said in Matthew 6.25 to 6.34, five times he said, take no thought. Take no thought. Five times. And you know why he said it five times? Because if you learn how Eastern mystics write, they will write using numerology and the numbers of phrases. The five times symbolize the five wounds, symbolize the five senses, which must be shut down. Five times. Take no thought. <coughs> and then in Matthew 6, 33, Jesus Christ said, Seek first the kingdom of God. And where did he say the kingdom of God is? Within you. It's Jesus Christ that said to seek within yourself for the kingdom of God. In Luke 11:52, he gave you an instruction. He said, look, you're taking away the key of knowledge because you're not entering within yourself. If you would, if you would, you know what you've got. Do me a favor. Let's go right now. Just let's take a look at page 71 in your little Bibles. Go to Luke. 11, okay, and go to verse 52. Look at it. It's, in many Bibles, it's written in red because it's the words of Jesus Christ. It's what Jesus Christ is saying. And this is what I'm trying to tell you. I'm, I'm saying it's not something that I made up. It's what he said. And he's talking to people who are Bible scholars. In those days, they were called lawyers. And he says in Luke 11, 52, whoa, in other words, it's going to be tough for your lawyers because you've taken away the key of knowledge, not only you're not entering in yourselves, but them that are trying to enter in, you're hindering. Do you see it? Is it in your book? Isn't it important that you see it? Doesn't he say you're not entering in yourselves, and so you're taking away the key of knowledge? Why? Because where did he say the kingdom was in Luke 17, 21? Within you. The kingdom of God is within you, so you have to enter within yourself in order that you may be able to receive that which is the key of knowledge. And then you begin to understand these things. Look what we're talking about here. We're talking about the time that all religion has cried for. Everybody has preached about. Everybody has written about. You used to go to Baptist churches, Methodist churches, Catholic churches, Pentecostal churches, and they all talked about Christ is coming, the second coming of Christ. Here it comes. The bridegroom is coming back for the bride. You're invited to the marriage of the Lamb. Here it comes. Comes. Here it comes and you can see it. That Uranus is known mythologically as the Son of Heaven. And the Son of Heaven is coming back to reclaim Gaia, the earth. The and they're going to have this wedding in the sign of Aquarius, which is the man with the pitcher of water, where Jesus turned the water of the wine, and Jesus Christ gave you instructions. Look with me. Look with me. You're in the book of Luke. Look at Luke 22. 
Look at Luke 22. And come with me. And what did Jesus Christ say? He said, enter within yourself. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. And what did he say? Behold, Luke 22, verse 10. Are you with me? Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house. The man with the pitcher of water is Aquarius. Follow him. Because that's where the wedding is going to take place. Uranus will join with Gaia in Aquarius. That's where the wedding is going to take place. And if you'll be open to it, if you'll attend the wedding by bringing yourself as Jesus Christ had prepared, watch, being prepared. What was the whole admonition? Please pay attention to me. Because I've I, I got to tell you something so important. What was the whole admonition of the five virgins? There were five foolish... Five, what were the five wise virgins waiting for? Do you know what they were waiting for? The bridegroom. They were waiting for the bridegroom. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and they said, where's the bridegroom? There was five of them because they symbolized your sight, taste, touch, smell, hearing. Same reason Jesus said, take no thought five times. The same of the five senses. Sight, taste, touch, smell, hearing. The bridegroom. And what are you waiting for right now? You're waiting for the bridegroom. Well, here it is. I'm here to tell you. Let's take all this junk away. So the bridegroom. Here comes the bridegroom. The Son of Heaven is coming back for the bride. Every mythological report, every statement, every ancient document is always, Uranus is the bridegroom and he is returning to claim Gaia, the bride. Uranus is called the son of heaven and the bride, this new wedding is going to be consummated in the sign of Aquarius, the man with the pitcher of water. And Jesus Christ said, when you see the man with the pitcher of water, enter into the house. Follow him, the bridegroom. This is everything that you've ever waited for. Everything that you've ever prayed about. Everything that you saw Billy Graham talk about or Oral Roberts talk about or Pope John talk about. Anything that any religious or Christian person has ever talked about. The second coming, the Son of Heaven coming back to claim His bride is happening right now. And you can put a date on it, 2010. They say, well, no man knows the hour. No mind does know the hour. But this doesn't come from the mind. It comes from deep within the wells of the Holy Temple, the Spirit within And it's going to happen. And there's going to be a great thing happening in, in 1993 when Uranus enters Neptune. Neptune is the constellation of the unconscious. And all of this, you think that you're getting these feelings now? You think that you're starting to understand about meditation? You have these deep feelings within yourself of peace? People come because we can't even think about war anymore. Don't tell me because I was always, man, we, Joan and I used to go to John Birch meetings. They used to pull the shades down. We'd have flags and guns and everything. I mean, it was, we were ready. We wanted to fight. And the whole thing is gone. This beautiful thing moved within both of us and swept that all away. The right side of the doors opened up. And now war, shooting, killing is unthinkable. I was telling people the other night, we, Joan and I sat for a minute, we turned on Christian television. Trinity Broadcasting Network. And there, Mr. Crouch, who is the leader of the Trinity Broadcasting Network, was giving a present to one of the other people on the stage. And they were all laughing about it and joking about it because it looked like somebody else. And what they had was a frog playing a harp. A frog standing on its hind legs with its head back playing a harp. And they thought it was so funny. It wasn't a ceramic frog. It wasn't a plastic frog. It was a real frog that had been killed and stuffed to make this ornament. And the insensitivity, and they couldn't, they kept laughing, this is a real frog. They thought it was so funny. In that animal, in that animal is as much of God as is in any human being. And nothing must die to be an ornament for somebody else's joke. The insensitivity. And if that's what they call Christianity, I don't want any part of that. I don't want to think like that. I won't think like that. So, this is what I call the new age. That Christ is love. Christ is peace. War is intolerable anymore. Children, old people, nobody can die anymore because God is coming back to claim his bride. In the heavens. Oh, you say, well, how do... Oh, that's a bunch of stars. It's a bunch of stars, is it? Look at the... Turn to the very first page of the Bible. 
Turn to the very first page of the Bible. You want to know what the sign... Turn to the very first page of the Bible and look here in Genesis... Genesis... 1, verse 14. And these are talking about stars. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs. And they said, to, what did they say to Jesus? What will be the sign of your coming? What will be the sign of your coming? And what does God say should be for signs? The stars. Oh, I would have loved to have been there when Tsar Roster came down out of his, whatever he comes out of. I can't imagine him with his turban or whatever, a strange Iranian Persian prophet. And he went over to the magicians. Aha, uh -huh. what do you think magi means? I was there, oh, the magi came. You know, the root word of magician is magi. They were astrologers. And he came and he gathered his astrologers in this little tent. And he said, and I would imagine the way Zoroaster would talk, there will be a sign. And the sign will be in the constellation of the woman <coughs> with the child. And this is what Zoroaster said exactly. He said, that sign will announce the new avatar who will herald in the new age. Read it, understand it, and what it appears in coma of the virgin, follow it. And so they read it. They read the sign. And it led them to the new avatar. The new avatar is the new spiritual leader who comes from God, who will herald in the new age. And they found the Christ because of the sign. And I am telling you right here, as you sit here, there is a sign in the heavens. And it is a mighty sign which is swinging in a great arc up into the constellation Aquarius, the man with the water. And there will be a wedding. And when that wedding occurs, the waters will be changed to wine by the Christ. And the whole point of this message is, please, please, please come to the wedding. Whatever you have to do, Put it aside that you may come to the wedding. And you come to prepare yourself, prepare yourself for the bridegroom by entering the closet and closing the door when you pray, meditate. Practice the single eye, meditate. Take no thought, meditate. Seek the kingdom within you, meditate. Enter within yourself, meditate. Cast your net to the right side, meditate. Cast your net to the right side. And you'll find. Now, you, 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 you can go another way. And you might go and, and, and say, well, I'm not sure. Okay. And I can understand that because I can't prove all of this other than to send you the documents where you can look. But let me ask you this. Let's take a look at the alternative to what I've said. The alternative to what I said is that the chances are you'll probably die hoping that there is something after you die that's going to be nice. That's the alternative. And in the meantime, you will live on this planet Earth with children pumping drugs into themselves and being pumped in by other people, with teenagers committing suicide and mass, with people like presidents and sheiks planning constantly to drop bombs on people. What kind of torture is being put upon young men and women and children right now over there because of the egos of these two men? We can whip their you-know-what. I ain't moving out of nothing. This is going to be a fight, and you're going to get slaughtered. You're gonna... And here are the Iraqi soldiers and the American soldiers and all of the other soldiers sitting here waiting to be sent to battle. Charge, men, says the man who's parked 2,000 miles away. Charge. Go give them hell. Say, what about the little children? There's no bomb. There's no bomb that comes down and says, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I can only fall on soldiers. I, I've got to get out of here. Do you know how many thousands of little babies? If you were to walk back and the little kids are watching the little show back there, do you know how, can you picture them? Can you picture a bomb exploding in that room and, and, and parts of these children being blown all over the place? That's what's going to happen. That's intolerable to allow that or think of that. I don't care. There's got to be other ways. 
And there is. See. And that's why he's coming. See. Even the idea of waiting and threatening each other, isn't there a way that two grown men can put their ego down long enough to say, the heck with all the formalities, I'll meet you here, you meet me here, we'll sit down and we'll talk about this? Instead of putting on a show, and say, what about a soldier who's, 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 who's a, who, whose wife is just having a baby? He, and he doesn't know now whether he's going to be able to ever see that baby because this guy's threatening and that guy's threatening and they're calling each other names. But they're not going to fight with one another. It's these guys. Here, the Iraqi soldier who happens to work in a department store in Baghdad is going to shoot at uh, the American soldier who happens to work uh, on a truck. Uh, he's a truck driver. They don't even know each other. They're going to shoot at each other because of these two guys. See? It's intolerable. And that's why you plug in. Because there is a unity now, a oneness in the center, a oneness of purpose, and a oneness of life that you and I must experience and allow to be ours. We must find the center. We must eliminate chronos. We must not dwell in the past. We must not dwell in the future. We must dwell in the center. And we must not allow anyone to take the present moment from us. We must live in the present moment and consume the present moment. And we must be willing to close our eyes now and say to the great God whose spirit is dwelling within us, who is the God of all people, the one shepherd of all life, yes, I am coming to the wedding. Count me in. I wouldn't miss it for the world. I want to see this. I want to be a part of this. Save me a table. Put my name. And make sure that you got my name written right on the little guessing so when I get to the wedding, I'll know exactly where I am to sit because I want to see the bridegroom come and reclaim his bride. Yes, I, I'll be there. And that requires you now to start doing your work in your meditation. And when you open your mind to meditation now, you are opening your mind to the vibrations that come from the great Son of God, who is coming <laughs> closer and closer Uranus. Oh, you know, there's got to be a way, isn't there? Doesn't there have to be a way? Some way your mind knows God. What makes your brain suddenly start thinking God ways? where it never did be. Does something have to happen? I mean, God's world is, a, is, a, is, is law and physics. Doesn't something have to take place? Doesn't something have to change a cycle, a vibration? Something has to change in order for your brain to start being opening to higher things instead of lower things. This is what it is. This is what it is. Everything is coming now to change the cycles, to change the vibrations. You must plug into it. Prepare for the wedding. <laughs>